Hey, good afternoon. My name is Alan Hazard. My privilege to introduce our next speaker, Dan Soderberg, is a native San Diego, fourth generation California, with family ties to San Diego pioneer Captain Henry Delano Finch. His parents were residents of Bankers Hill during World War II, and Dan feels a special connection with the neighborhood through that history. Dan is currently Soho's Vice President, Chairman of Soho's Modernism Committee, and Chair of the Neighborhood Historic Preservation Coalition. Dan works professionally as a filmmaker, creator of Soho's award-winning documentary, Four Decades of Historic Preservation in San Diego County, an architectural photographer. He is a 15-year resident of Normal Heights, serving on the community planning group and living in a 1927 bungalow, which he has worked to restore through the years. So please welcome Dan. Thank you. Yes, Alan mentioned my uh, parents uh, living in Bankers Hill. That was during World War II, and uh, the house that you're looking at is the house they lived in. That house was located at Fifth and Grape. Um, the house is gone, as uh, with so many great houses in uh, Bankers Hill and San Diego, it gave way to a parking lot, uh, the parking lot for the Sharp Reese uh, Steely Clinic. Um, this photo was taken in the 1940s, which is, of course, the time they were there. That's my mom and dad. Uh, at that time, uh, and the photo was actually taken in Balboa Park, which was, of course, a, a pleasant walk for them. Uh, the information below that is from the um, voter registration. Uh, lists my dad uh, as being in the U.S. Marine Corps and my mom working in the aircraft industry, in fact, was a rosy riveter. So uh, now to the presentation. The name of the story is Lost Sixth Avenue. It's a time machine journey utilizing historic photos, Sanborn maps, and brief biographies of both the, the people and the houses that were along this historic uh, street. San Diego. March 1887, you're looking at uh, Balboa Park when it was called City Park. It was not developed at that time for sure. And uh, you'll note that on this grid, 6th uh, Street, or that's what it was called, 6th Street then, uh, doesn't go beyond A Street. Here's a detail of that map. Um, you'll see all the lots along City Park are virtually on the park. There is no street. Uh, and there's only two landmarks indicated in Bankers Hill, Florence Hotel and a reservoir. This is a Sanborn map from 1906 showing the Hillcrest side of Bankers Hill. Uh, Sixth Street, uh, as you see, goes through Hillcrest and then kind of peters out around the park place, which is uh, today Upas. And the open area up there, you see, is where Kate Sessions started her uh, nursery in Balboa Park. The proposal for making Park Avenue a through street was uh, very controversial at the time. Uh, this plan was opposed by park supporters and nearby homeowners. And uh, they objected to losing parkland and were very concerned about the inappropriate uh, development of the park. That project required 38,000 cubic yards of fill dirt in Mulvey Canyon. Um, but despite the objections and concerns, approval was given to the project on March 3, 1913, and they cited that the road would uh, better support the 1915 exposition. Kate Sessions, she was uh, opposed to that project. She preferred uh, having the, the natural canyon and, and landscaping it. Uh, she was a native Californian, a daughter of a California pioneer. Uh, she taught school, but her most famous role was that of the mother of Balboa Park. She leased uh, 36 acres of the northwest corner of Balboa Park from 1892 to 1903, and that was for her nursery. Her lease stipulated that she plant 100 trees initially and 300 trees uh, a year thereafter. Kate Sessions' Rose Garden and Nursery. 
in Balboa Park. Uh, you see the Lath House on the right, and uh, the house that she lived in is uh, there on the left. That would have been along the edge of uh, Park Place or, or Upas. And here's a 1921 Sanborn map showing that area, the open area of the park where her nursery was, and it shows the intersection there of Upas with uh, Park Avenue. And uh, you get the outline of the, uh, the buildings that were there at the time. This is a terrific building right in the northeast corner of 6th and Park Place. Uh, it's the Hazard Residence. Uh, I don't have the information about which Hazard built this or the architect, but I certainly admire the features of it, especially those upper level windows right there. And right next to it was a very important building. That's the Hamilton Residence by Irving Gill. Not on 6th, but close enough, and I wanted to show it to you. It's the Hamilton Residence of 1908. Uh, it's really a neat thing because it, uh, you know, Gill created a screen-covered garden court as the, the main room of the house. Uh, he had an arcade surrounding the court uh, that provided the only access to the rooms. And uh, as I say, it was designed to be uh, the main room of the house. It was written up in Craftsman Magazine in February 1915. Uh, the garden court included furniture, carpets, and a wall fountain. And the arcade uh, could be curtained off as well, uh, creating additional guest rooms. And you, you kind of see the uh, little curtain there on the side there. And it was a classic gill, low horizontal profile, simple shapes, relieved by arches. Uh, this was uh, the classic Irving Gill style. Bankers Hill was a close-knit neighborhood, as was much of San Diego. Uh, there you see Mrs. Tomlinson, Thomas Hamilton. Uh, she's third from the left, seated on the couch. Thomas Hamilton's father, Charles, married Anna. Um, Elizabeth, uh, well, let's see, here we go. Tom, Thomas Hamilton's father married, uh, uh, Charles married um, Elizabeth. Uh, Charles was George Marston's former business partner and head of Hamilton's Limited. That was an upscale, upscale grocery downtown. The Thomas Hamiltons lived in the uh, Gill home from 1908 to 1910 before it became property of Mary White Fulford, cousin of George Marston. So uh, all these connections. Sadly, that history and great architecture has been buried by this uh, these concrete monsters that are there today. And the Arthur W. Jenks house that has bore witness to all the changes on 6th Avenue at the 6th and Upas since the year 1900. Grand Victorian. I skipped one there. Okay. This is the block from Upas to Thorn, the Sanborn 1921 map. You see three dwellings, and you see uh, an apartment building. Uh, they're all still there. The Park Lawn Apartments, this is a 1936 photo, and this is it today. To be honest, I don't know if uh, that's the original building that's been modified or whether it's a replacement, but uh, that's the view of it today. And next door is the Percy Benbow residence. It was an empty lot purchased by Bembo to build this house in 1909. Percy Bembo was uh, born in England and came here at age four with his family. And early on, he ran a grocery store and a men's clothing store. He uh, took over and expanded the uh, family mortuary business, which is probably what most people associate the name with uh, in San Diego. And, among other things. Uh, he served on city council, was a fire superintendent, and police chief. In 1935, he began two terms of mayor as mayor of San Diego, and uh, he's the only mayor to have actually died in office. He passed away on November 4th, 1942. He's, he's there shoveling dirt at uh, the San Vicente uh, Dam site. And there's the house today it seems to be crying for somebody to come along and restore it. A few modifications there. 
The house next door to it is still there, as is this one. And I don't know if you noticed in the Sanborn map, it indicated uh, a stone foundation. And as you walk around the place, there it is. Thorn to, to Spruce, 1921. Got uh, three dwellings right there. This one's gone, but I put up that just to show the outline of the building. You'd have to guess it was a Victorian type of structure with uh, perhaps tower elements there in the lower corners, likely bay windows as well. And, and that was replaced in 1936 by the Las Palmas Apartments. And this is from a newspaper. Um, and the caption reads, the Las Palmas Apartments owned by I. Bowman and S. Bowman at the southwest corner of 6th and Thorn Streets, consisting of eight units, five doubles, and three singles. Build of stucco, Mediterranean type, has just been opened for its preview showing. The structure was designed and constructed by Milo L. Berenson and has several innovations from a utility standpoint. It has a handmade tile roof, each unit having large living and dining rooms with dinette that overlooks the park nearby. That's what we have there today. The Colonel Irving Solomon Apartments, 1958, designed by master architect Henry Hester. It's a City of San Diego Historical Landmark, number 801. Sure glad to have that saved, but did you know that it replaced San Diego's only green and green designed house. It's the Q House, designed by famous Pasadena architects, green and green. Mary Marston Q commissioned the greens to design a five bedroom English style residence, garage, and landscaping in 1912. This is the view from Fifth Street. And bear in mind, uh, the houses were typically uh, oriented to either Fifth Street or the cross streets. Uh, the park was not considered a desirable view at the time. <laughs> the house actually has a couple of cousins uh, very similar to it, uh, designed by Green and Green. Uh, the massing and materials of the house were similar to the 1902 James Culbertson house in Pasadena, but uh, with refinements more like the Mortimer Fleischbecker Senior House in Woodside, California. The lower level had carefully placed stones at the base of the foundation that gradually gave way to a pebble dash wall surface. The upper levels had half timbering and shingle in the fill. The house had an elaborate and expensive rolled eave roof. The seemingly sculptured surface was meant to resemble thatch. The shingles were individually shaped to give the roof an irregular, an irregular surface treatment. And let me grab some water. I forgot to bring it. <laughs> the Tudor style was carried out with the small window panes oak linen fold paneled interiors, and uh, broad carved stone fireplaces. Construction lasted over a year from early 1913 to 1914. Mary White Marston was the sister of George Marston, and she was married to attor attorney Michael Q. This is the view of it from Fifth Street. There are a couple uh, workers there, one is sweeping the sidewalk, the other is uh, trimming the hedge. And a view from Park Manor Hotel. And just look at the seven foot arts and crafts stone wall. What a magnificent structure that is. And uh, for friends of historic, or friends of historic neon, uh, check out the Park Manor neon sign. Not only the blade sign, but the one hanging in the window there. Moving on, Spruce to Redwood. Not much happening in 1906, one dwelling. And then it picks up in 1921. And, but these are important, some important buildings right here. And in 1950, it fills in 
the most prominent one, of course, being the Park Manor Hotel. Um, Park Manor Hotel, uh, this is a from magazine uh, uh, spread that uh, shows the attributes of the hotel, including the uh, spacious rooms, the decorative entrance, and the famous people that came. That's Amelia Earhart sunning herself. It touts its uh, pr close proximity to uh, Balboa Park. Um, those, by the way, are, are palm trees that were planted by Kate Sessions. And check out the park that was behind the Park Manor Hotel, which is unfortunately today just an asphalt parking lot. But that's the view of it today. Here's a view from the top of the Park Manor. You see not only Balboa Park, but uh, check out the uh, roofs of two very important buildings right along the street. Uh, in the center there is, is the Sherwin, Sherwood Wheaton House and then the Melville uh, Clobber House there on, this, on the edge. <clears throat> the Sherwood Wheaton House, 1908. It's an Irving Gill. Fantastic. The smooth stucco walls with contrasting open tiles and the clinker brick used in the foundation and chimney it has uh, that distinctive stepped parapet design. Sherwood Wheaton served on the uh, San Diego Playground Commission. I believe he was instrumental in the, the 1950 exposition and was very involved, uh, I think was uh, involved with one of the local banks as well. And that house was demolished in 1979 for this. It's been a scar on the streetscape for 33 years. They're, as you see, now starting to build it up. Moving from along from uh, Redwood to Quince, 1906, nothing's happening. And then uh, 1921, the uh, 1907 to 1908 Melvin Clobber House. In 1979, it was Irving Gill's most important remaining structure. It was in good condition, had excellent structural integrity. It was a Gill masterpiece representing a major turning point in his career. It led the way for a more refined and versatile application uh, of concrete. Although uh, the clobber house is framed in stucco brick veneer, the smooth walls and the clean punched openings became trademarks of Gill's later severe style in concrete. The finely detailed eave brackets have a Japanese influence, but the house is classic Gill, every detail. The greatly simplified craftsman interiors. Here we see the curved central staircase uh, beginning from the bottom. It was a, it was a focal point of this, this house, really, one of the focal points, uh, moving up to the uh, second floor. And indeed, uh, it spectacularly went from the ground floor all the way to the third floor. And the third floor had an artist studio for Clobber's wife, Amy. And I, I've just been informed that one of her paintings is uh, on the back wall, so be sure and check that out. There's her studio. It included a private balcony, fireplace, built-in seat around the parameter of the room. The distinct overhang protects the nearby floor, to protects that uh, uh, nearly floor-to-ceiling glass wall. By 1979, the effort to save the Clobber House was Soho's hardest-fought battle. There were lawsuits, countersuits, Supreme Court hearings, and that happened to be my first awareness of Soho, by the way. Uh, I participated in one of the uh, protests in Balboa Park, right across the street from uh, the Clobber House in 1979 and the efforts to save it. I remember signing the petition. Many alternatives to demolition were brought forward, but the owners were hell-bent on demolition no matter what. A youth hostel was interested in the property and a, and a proposal was brought forward. Plans were offered to move the building to Heritage Park or Balboa Park. 
Not even the airplane crash death of the developer could stop the demolition of this architectural masterpiece. As has become all too common, more energy was put into the demolition scheme than in getting secure financing for its replacement. Those who remembered the battle were taunted by the vacant lot at Six and Redwood for more than a decade until this big condo tower emerged. Of that block, the only historic fabric left of it is the, the apartment building right there in the middle. At the end there, here's the outline of the structure that was there. I don't have a picture of that except in the next slide I'll show you an indication of it, but that's what's there now. And you'll see right there in the middle there, that's Quince and, uh, and 6th Street. And uh, that, that was the house that occupied that lot. It's a great picture because you can see other things too. Of course, the Park Manor Hotel. You can see the uh, stepped uh, parapet of the, uh, of the Wheaton House. Uh, and more farther down, you, you only really see the uh, garden areas of the Clobber House. Uh, then the empty space where that apartment was that we just saw. And uh, then across the street, our next uh, house is the uh, Julia Dent Grant House. And for those of you who are residents of that area, pick out your favorite spot right there. Don't see the, uh, the meadows, but it's just out of the picture. <laughs> um, Sanborn, 1906, Quince to Palm. That's the uh, Julie Dent Grant House up there at the top. And the George uh, Hazard House is there at the bottom. The Julia Dent Grant House, it was uh, uh, built for her and her son, Jesse Root, and uh, Elizabeth Chapman Grant. Whoops. In 1852, the Army transferred uh, the 4th Infantry and Ulysses S. Grant to the West Coast. Passage through the jungles of Panama often resulted in illness and death. Knowing the danger of such a trip, Grant did not bring his pregnant wife and Julie and their small children. Uh, <clears throat> Grant was relieved to finally reach San Diego and grew to love it here. In, 1880, in 1877, he uh, told a journalist, it had always been the dream of mine to live in California. But of course, as we know, the Civil War and the presidency had other plans for him. Instead, it was his wife, Julia, and, the, and two of their three sons that moved to California in 1893, uh, a venture that was basically paid for by the uh, proceeds from Ulysses S. Grant's memoirs. They came across uh, in quite good style in a private car, and uh, all their belongings were brought with them. U.S. Grant. Jr. moved into the 1887 Hubble Mansion on Cortez Hill, Hill. and uh, at that time that was uh, considered perhaps the most opulent house in San Diego. Um, Julia and Jesse Grant built, uh, in contrast, the more modest Willing Sterling Heber design house on uh, 545 Quint Street in 1894. It's a colonial style design, it's, uh, and as I mentioned earlier, the earliest Homes uh, along 6th Avenue either faced the cross street or 5th. And also, you know, a downtown view was considered very desirable as well. It was a site of profound national significance, being the site of the Ulysses S. Grant Pre Presidential Library. It may well be the only house in San Diego that had its construction announcement, along with the rendering of the house published in the New York Times. It is the only known house in San Diego associated with the former First Lady of the United States. Jesse R. Grant was not only a prominent name in San Diego, but had national historic significance as a one-time presidential candidate who had influence in national politics. And I skipped one, I think. I need to show you the other one. <laughs> um, there was worldwide outrage when the ancient Buddha relief statues were used for artillery practice by the Taliban army. Unfortunately, locally, we have no shortage of people to do such dirty work. The advocates for demolition discounted the importance of Ulysses S. Grant and his family. One of the uh, most uh, ridiculous quotes was that uh, it didn't have significance because Ulysses S. Grant was a scoundrel and a drunk. 
Well, you know, I remember Abraham Lincoln was once told that, and he said, well, I'd like to find out which whiskey he drinks. I'd send each of my generals a barrel of it. <laughs> City staff strongly recommended designation, but the historic sideboard got hoodwinked by some bogus promises that they would save important elements of this structure and incorporate it into a, a, a new project to be an ice cream project, they, uh, uh, an ice, ice cream parlor. They, they promised to serve crumpets and ice cream to the neighborhood children and tell them how Miss how wonderful Mrs. Grant was, but that didn't happen. As a result, the site was not designated. Um, demolition was allowed, the developer was dropped out of the project, and all there was left to do was protest, but to no avail. Whoops, that thing really skips. As with the Clobber House and the Wheaton House, history was destroyed for the net gain of a mere vacant lot. Sixth and Quince, to this day, is a vacant lot. R.I.P. Julie Dent Grant and Ju Jesse R. Grant House. Only one structure on this block from 1921 will survive, and that is the George and Alice Hazard residence of 1911. San Diego Historic Landmark Number 939, designated November 20th 2009 under Criterion C, architecture as an excellent example of Italian Renaissance revival architecture, a house that we nearly lost. Moving on down, palm to olive. This lot, or this block, is really all about one building, and that is the Keating Mansion. The Keating Mansion, 1891, designed by the Reed brothers, who designed the Hotel del Coronado. Keating was a millionaire through uh, selling uh, agricultural implements, things like uh, hay balers and uh, cotton gins and plows, what have you. Uh, the mansion had a third floor ballroom overlooking City Park, and it was the highlight of San Diego social scene up until Mrs. Keating's death in 1909. It uh, later housed a Mexican restaurant and a boarding house, and it sat vacant for a long time, suffering vandalism. It's a beautiful interior woodwork and railings, uh, and woodwork had suffered a lot of damage. It was demolished in 1955. This is a great view to show really what uh, you know, Bankers Hill was like in the days, especially the, uh, the houses facing City Park. And that's what's there today. The Keating Mansion, uh, in the 1950, a Sanborn map is listed as a boarding house, but is also joined by uh, two other uh, structures on the block. Uh, that would be the Balboa Apartments. This is a photo from 1929, and uh, this is today. Not a lot has changed except some bad windows. And uh, Sanborn, from, from Olive to Net Nutmeg, not much going on there. And uh, 1921, uh, this block is really all about St. Paul's Cathedral. There it is today. This is a good view. I like this <laughs> from uh, Fifth Avenue looking towards Sixth. There's uh, Tom's Cafe with this classic neon sign. St. Paul's hadn't f fully been uh, developed yet. Uh, a billboard, you can't make it out, but it. Uh, Looking closely, it says uh, it's about uh, Heinz baby food. And sort of the same view today. That little Tom's Cafe is still there. It's now, what's it, Star Bar Barrio Mexican? <laughs> yeah. And we're certainly fortunate to have such a beautiful building. Sanborn, 1906, Nutmeg to Maple. In 1921, two, two dwellings to talk about, the Hugo Clobber House and the Palomar Apartments. The one there in the middle, the, uh, the, the, the 1920, the, at 2630, there's the outline of it in the site today. But this, this is the Hugo Clobber House, 1909. He was a brother of Melville Clobber. Um, 
another classic gill design, compact geometric form, long bands of casement windows, the entrance uh, facing the side, not the street. And that was a uh, trait of Irving Gill. And also another architect whom he happened to, to know personally, that was Frank Lloyd Wright. They didn't have their openings or their entrances right on the street, typically. Um, and that's what's there today. And then the 1950 Sanborn map shows the addition of the modern apartments at uh, Sixth and Nutmeg. Uh, here it's called the Jacobson Apartments, but uh, there it is today. And it is uh, City of San Diego Historical Landmark Number 811, Le Modern Apartments, built in 1930. And the Palomar Apartments, that's a, a Mead and Requa construction from 1914. Check out the neon sign. And there it is today. The 1906 uh, Sanborn of Maple to Laurel. And this is about uh, one important structure as well. That's the Sefton Mansion. Uh, also in the middle there would be uh, an aviary or bird cages, I think it says. But the Sefton Mansion was uh, built in 1889. It was at 6th and Laurel. Joseph Sefton uh, at his uh, large screen aviary. The, the property gardens were the scene of many social gatherings in San Diego. Sefton was a collector of birds and had an extensive collection of species. And after his death in 1908, his widow and son gave the birds to the city. The collection became the foundation of the current collection of the San Diego Zoo. Um, from Maple to Laurel, uh, 1921, the Sefton Mansion is now listed as a boarding house. And then it's a restaurant in 1950. And then it was demolished uh, to make way for the Park West branch of the San Diego Trust and Savings Bank. That, that was their business, family business, by the way, the San Diego Trust and Savings Bank. And, uh, Inside this bank were paintings, by the way, of the original Sefton grounds, including the views of the aviary. And there it is, the site today. I, uh, I'm, I'm very against tall buildings along places like uh, City Park, like Balboa Park. Uh, it, it, I, I also happened to notice when I was at El Prado recently that uh, you, know, you have that wonderful straight view from one end of the Prado down you know, past the California Tower and across the Cabrillo Bridge. And that viewscape should have been preserved. Instead, you get the California Tower with this in the background. Uh, 1921, Laurel to Calmia. And a great house right there. It's the uh, house designed by Hazel Waterman. And, but this view right here is great, because you can only see that. But you also see the Sefton Mansion. But look farther down, you can also see the uh, Hugo Clobber house as well. The 1907 William Clayton house, 545 Laurel. Uh, it's a craftsman with um, a, a craftsman influenced prairie style home by Hazelwood Waterman. It was nearly lost to uh, redevelopment uh, in 1987. It sat vacant for nine years, but finally became a uh, city of San Diego historical landmark number 270 on uh, February 25th, 1990. Hazelwood Waterman, San Diego's first female architect. She was mentored by Irving Gill, who she worked for. And in turn, years later, she, was men uh, she mentored other architects, including Lillian Rice and Frank L. Hope. William Clayton, uh, he, was, uh, he built the house in 1907, and he, and he lived there all the way to his death uh, in 1934 at the age of 75. Uh, he helped spearhead the 1915 Pal uh, Panama, California Exposition and was a board member and vice president of the Spreckles Companies. And he was regarded as an important figure during the progressive building years of um, early 20th century San Diego. Uh, interesting story, he was uh, critically wounded on March 12, 1917 by this guy here who uh, afterwards kept uh, muttering over and over again, I wanted to kill him, I wanted to kill him. Uh, one report said he was angry for not getting a job from Clayton, and another report said that it had to do with a car accident that happened several years before. Um, 
So here we are uh, in 1950 uh, with the addition of new structures down at the south end. And those structures are all gone, been replaced by that. Calmia to uh, Jun Juniper, 1906. And again, we're really talking about one important building there that uh, would be the Arnold Mansion. The Arnold Mansion, 1895. One oral history described 22 rooms and 18 marble fireplaces. I was unable to see any plans that confirm that, but nonetheless, uh, it probably was one reason it was ideal for conversion as a boarding house later. Uh, the entrance of that house was, uh, as you could anticipate, would be on Fifth Avenue, but then they built a big apartment building in front of it, so they actually had to carve out a new entrance on the other side when Sixth uh, went through. And that would be that side there. This is a great view of uh, before pre-Sixth uh, Avenue, the Arnold Mansion facing Mulvey Canyon. Um, and of course, uh, I mentioned it, would, it was originally to be developed with uh, rustic stone lined with uh, paths, bridges, and pergolas, which is what Kate Sessions wanted, but uh, it got filled in. Whoop. And then it became Park Avenue, and then uh, Sixth Avenue. But that's a great view. You can see the, uh, uh, the Arnold Mansion and uh, looking down Sixth Avenue. 1921 um, and 1950. Now the Arnold Mansion's a boarding house. And then 1956, a clinic. You know, the Arnold Mansion was replaced by dental offices, and it seems to me that this place would have been ideally uh, adaptively reused to be dental offices. In fact, a lot of houses have done that. Historic houses have become that. And this is the site today, 1955 Parkview Medical Center. And the building itself may well be up for historic review one of these days. And 1906 Juniper to Ivy. It's all about this building here. Ooh, that thing flew away. That's the John Gay Mansion, 1890. William Sterling Hebert, architect. Uh, and it's right along the Mulvey Canyon as well. You see both the, uh, the Gay Mansion and uh, the uh, Arnold Mansion. And the view from Mulvey Canyon, including the Arnold Mansion again. And I'm looking at this picture thinking perhaps that the plan for filling in the canyon had already started because there's a lot of debris right there. And then you can see uh, Sixth Avenue have, uh, it has developed pretty well at this point, but do notice it stops there at Juniper, so it still hasn't gone all the way through. And a 1930 view, and that's uh, Sixth Avenue, not only continuous, but completely paved. It was San Diego's only cut stone mansion. And I love this picture. You've got the uh, tennis players out there and uh, the man with his uh, golf driver probably shooting into that cage right there, although I guess he could have probably shot the other way into the, into the park. And this is the view from Fifth, the front entrance. And a uh, little glimpse of life inside the gay mansion. They're smoking cigars and playing cards. That's uh, John Gay. He's seated on the right. Uh, he made his fortune in the sugar business, which uh, and it was a family business based in Louisiana. Moved to California, San Diego for health reasons in 1886. He passed away in 1915 at Hacumba Hot Springs, where he was uh, staying to try to rehabilitate his health. And great view of that place. And this is uh, looking south on 6. The, the, the gay mansion is there on, on the right, a little bit shadowed. Whoop. And I like what this had to say. Day by day, the grand old John Gay castle-like home at 6th and Juniper is slowly taken apart by a wrecking crew. It won't be long now until the finest of Gay 90 residences will be only a memory. And that was by George Hazard, whose house we saw earlier. And that's what we have there today. Pretty generic, huh? Um, 
and then the Sanborn, Ivy to Hawthorne. There's a corral and hen house right, right there in the middle. Sanborn to Ivy, 1921. Then now a dwelling replaces the hen house. And offices at Ivy and Sixth. And that's the site now. That, that building is so bad, they had, they had to plant those big trees in front of it. <laughs> Hawthorne to Grape, that's uh, almost empty, excuse me. And uh, 1921, still pretty empty. And then uh, in 1950, uh, got uh, a, you know, a uh, courtyard of bungalows and a office, uh, medical offices. And those offices today are the Balboa Park City School. This is a, another, you, you, we've seen a few, I didn't really mention it, but just a number of these Richard Wheeler buildings that uh, are along 6th Avenue. And the uh, bungalows are gone, yet another wonderful parking lot. And from grape to fir, got one dwelling and one shed in 1906. 1921, we got uh, the Wilson S. Smith and Company garage. And you got a view of that from the, um, the uh, this is Fifth and Grape. You know, my parents' place was just behind where this picture was taken. Uh, looking towards Six, 1940, and, and the garage areas are right there on the right. And the site today. And the next block, uh, this block going down, we got, uh, at 1970, we got the offices of Hubble and Hubble Architects. And we got these survivors here, Parkview Manor Apartments, 1954 6th Avenue. And that's not so wonderful, but uh, that's what it was back in the 1940s, I think it was. Oh, I, I did read somewhere that simple Amy McPherson appeared at this church. Amy's Got it. <laughs> and then uh, San, uh, Fur to Elm, and then Fur to Elm, that's the, on the other side, the Emporium Block. And then in 1950, these apartments went in. That's the Antoinette Apartments in 1939. Edward H. DePue, who is now regarded as a master architect and builder. And there it is today. Still looks pretty good. Sanborn, uh, Elm to date, date. And uh, that's that's build, that building today, actually, you know, the old house is back there. It just needs to have all that junk taken off. And, of course, most of Elm and all of Date was erased by Interstate 5. And at the corner of 6th and Date was the Isaac Irwin House, another Irving Gill that we lost in 1907. Isaac Irvin, uh, Irwin was a leader in... Uh, commercial and public affairs. He was on the board of directors of the Citizens Savings Bank of San Diego. And then you see the, his place down there um, in 1950. It's listed as a clinic. And then uh, some other surviving structures on that block would be the, uh, this little duplex right there and these apartments. And again, going back in time, looking back north, that's Date Street right there. You can barely make out uh, the distinctive roof of the Antoinette Apartments. And you can also see that apartment building we just saw a moment ago. And I believe you can actually see that sort of messed up front that we saw earlier as well. This is a great view of uh, San Diego before the freeway went in. And you can get an idea of, uh, you know, it was right, right there at the edge of Balboa Park and it wiped out uh, part of Elm and, and all of Date Street. Uh, that photo, you can actually make out a lot of the buildings we've, we've just seen. I don't know if we can project it this way, but. 
any rate, uh, that's, uh, that's our whirlwind tour of 6th Avenue, our lost 6th Avenue. This is uh, a project that uh, was greatly uh, enhanced and the great help to uh, Sari Johnson, who provided a lot of great material that you just saw. And the colorized photos, uh, my friend Bjorn, and as you might guess, the, uh, the historic photo collection. And there you have it. That's Lost Sixth Avenue. Um, thank you very much. How did I do on time? Did it, did it go long? I lost track. <laughs> yeah, questions? Excellent. I guess we're going to have a break, and then Alan will be next. Thank you very much. Okay. <laughs>